Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this uh, uh, round table on the future of oncology. Um, my name is uh, Craig Jordan. I am a professor of uh, breast medical oncology at the MD Anderson Hospital, and um, my specific interest is to um, devise drugs to take them into the clinic. And the two drugs that we've been working on is a group of drugs called CIRMS and a targeted therapy with tamoxifen. I'm Phil Febo, Chief Medical Officer at Illumina. I'm a medical oncologist, spent my career trying to get molecular insight into the care of cancer patients. Hi, I'm Carla Balch. I'm the CEO at IntelliQuit, and we are a clinical trial matching technology. I've been in the oncology space for 20 years. Hello, TJ Sharp. I am a stage four melanoma survivor. I have taken my diagnosis and journey through cancer and become an advocate and an advisor in the pharmaceutical and clinical trial world. I'm Laura Esserman. I'm a surgeon and, uh, and, uh, and researcher. I run the breast cancer program at the University of California in San Francisco, and I also um, uh, founded and run two very large um, trials designed uh, to drive innovation. My name is Jared Blascock. I'm the CEO of Cofactor Genomics. And I am a computational biologist by training. Um, I've spent my last 20 years studying RNA and signals in RNA. And probably not uh, surprisingly, uh, Cofactor is a company that is focused on, on RNA and uh, use in diagnostics. And really one of a number of companies um, in our space that is looking at signals in order to better uh, diagnose and subtype cancer types um, so that we can uh, land on the right type of therapy for uh, patients. I'm Edith Mitchell. I'm a medical oncologist and clinical professor of medicine at the Sydney Kimmel Medical College at Jefferson University, where I'm also associate director of the Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center at Jefferson. I am the founding member and head the Center to Eliminate Cancer Disparities. I'm also uh, co-chair of the Disparities Committee for the Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group, or now known as ECOG Akron Cancer Research Group. So for the first question, we're making huge advances with enormous amounts of data. Um, and this data has to be presented so the patient can make some decisions. So how can we present data in a, a patient-centric way. Who would like to start that off? Well, I'm happy to start. Good. You know, I think the most important thing that we can do is, you know, I first, at first I think that care should look more like trials, and trials should look more like cares, care. And what do I mean by that? I mean that we should constantly be trying to learn. And when a patient comes in, they're hoping that you're going to use all the data and information that you've learned to date to help them make a decision. So the first thing we should start doing is collecting data in a way that we can actually learn in real time so that we can present patients with options. And I think, it's, I think we've often been trained to become advocates for our specialties, but in fact, we need to become advocates for our patients and understand that there are options here, the standard options, here's something that might be different, and here's what you, how you compare to doing nothing. And by the way, here are the different kinds of clinical trials that you can participate in, which are exploring different ways of approaching the same problem. And we actually have to have the time to sit down and run people through that in a way that they can actually truly understand it. Thank you. So think about this. So how should we practically share the data that is coming on and address it with the patients. Anybody would like to tackle that one? Certainly, I will. Okay. Uh, I think it's so important that we present data accurately and summarize the clinical trials that have been completed so that one can review them with the patient and in a manner that the patient understands, which means that we need to summarize the data and give key points at the sixth grade level. And anything higher really limits the readability and the understanding 
that patients will have. The other aspect of uh, oncology is that we have not really expressed data in a manner that the primary care physician understands. And in many cases, the primary care physician has taken care of that patient for a long time, has the trust of that patient, and therefore is able to communicate well with the patient. And what I find is that if you can communicate well with the primary care physician, if you keep the primary care physician involved in the patient's care, they're more likely to go on to a clinical trial. They're more likely to follow through on plans and procedures and follow the care plan. So if we're able to communicate well with the primary care physician, we have a much better chance of the patient understanding, of the patient making the right choice for them, and therefore making sure that we're including individuals into the communication network that need to be there and who can facilitate uh, the patient's understanding and therefore comprehension and participation. I'd like to add on sure. to that. I come, I come to this question in a product development and a technologic sort of answer. It feels like there's a broad chasm between a patient's language that they understand about their own diagnosis, and I'll be interested to see what you say about this, and the inclusion and exclusion criteria for a trial. Why can we not collect, we have the data, provide language that is the inclusion and exclusion criteria to the patient so they can become their own advocate? They may not understand every component, but if we give them the keys, the answers for inclusion or exclusion, they or their caregivers can become an advocate to have a voice at the table. So as they're approaching their primary care physician or their oncologist, they can at least say, I'm willing to participate. Where is my gap and which trial do I fit in? Well, I think that's a very important point because I, I will introduce um, uh, a different twist on what we're talking about. And, and that is um, what I've found, um, certainly in my experience within the clinics uh, at the MD Anderson, the patient is provided with a huge amount of information, but they're essentially numb. I couldn't remember all the things we're asking everybody to remember. And you do this on a Thursday, and you do that, and this, and collect this sample, and that sample. You know, and I, people just say yes, walk out of the office, I have no idea whether, whether that's going to be done. How do you feel? <laughs> I, I think myself and most patients that were in my situation and are in my situation feel overwhelmed, is, is the right word. Do I qualify? Am I going to meet an inclusion criteria? Or is an exclusion criteria going to keep me out of a treatment that actually might provide me with some benefit? There is a lot to assimilate to. When you don't have a background in this, I, I was not a, I was not certainly a medical professional. I understood clinical trials and still I was starting at, at ground zero. And most patients that aren't college educated, that, that have some uh, health disparities, that don't have the education to understand what a clinical trial it is and, and how that may fit in, in, their, in their care journey, they will just follow the, the primary care physician's recommendation or the first oncologist's recommendation, which might not be as informed as we would like it to be. I, I think that when you look at the, the care options out there, not everyone has the opportunity to go to an MD Anderson or to a, to a Jefferson. And that's, that's, a, that's a very big issue when a big segment of the population doesn't have access to someone who can guide them through that journey in an educated way. So one of my colleagues, Jeff Belcour, has developed a set of tools that we've actually implemented and used for the last 20 years in the clinic and something called consultation planning. And this is when we've actually used students and, you know, college students and our, <clears throat> and actually our whole intern workforce. And we do this something called co uh, consultation planning with the idea of someone and you help your patients prepare for their consultation and there's a, um, 
a way in which you ask them questions to prepare so that they are preparing the questions and concerns they have. And it's summarized on a, on a sheet of paper. So before you go in the room, you understand where that person is, what they're concerned about. They may have a sick child at home. They may be taking care of an ill, um, uh, an, an ill mother or uh, or they may be worried about uh, something, uh, you know, in their marriage. It, it, you, and it's a way in a moment's notice you can figure that out. And then what happens is that someone is recording the consultation, taking notes for that person, and kind of keeps the, makes sure the physician really answers those questions for patients. And I think the other thing that we need to do is be thinking a little bit more pragmatically about the way that we run trials. Instead of having our inclusion and exclusion so tight so that at the end of the day, the data and the trials don't really apply broadly. We need to be doing more pragmatic trials. In our big screening trial, we have it so that, you know, you, we're trying to randomize between, we, you know, we invite people to participate in the trial and say, look, you be one of the 100,000 women sharing your wisdom. You tell us. You help us figure out what the answer is. We'd like to randomize you because we don't know what the right answer is. We've been arguing about it for 40 years. So you can be assigned by chance, but if you feel strongly, you choose. And both pieces, both sets of data are important, but then you can answer different questions with different things. And even in our big ISPY trial, we, the people who are eligible for the trial and choose not to participate, we're gonna follow, that's your real world evidence. Because then you have a sense, both for clinicians and patients, does this really apply to me? Do I fit here? You know, and that, and really, and people could say, oh, we can't afford to advocate for our patients in that way. We can't afford that. But in fact, we have uh, medical scribes that come in the room because our medical systems are so arcane. I'll get to that, I know, in a minute. And people are like scribing for people. Well, wh why not get the structured data you need and have someone scribe for the patient and be an advocate for the patient? That's what everybody needs. That's the way I think the system ought to be. Wouldn't you have liked that? I would have loved that. I know many patients leave a doctor's office, leave an oncologist appointment, and Can't immediately go said. home and Google everything that they just wrote down because they don't understand it. And right. if you left with a, with a summary written down and mm -hmm. a tape that you could listen to over and over? Yes, they wouldn't have to go to Oncology Central to understand <laughs> everything that, that the, the oncologist just told them. You know, and a quick follow-up point to that is that there is a, there is a place for shared decision-making and understanding patient preferences. Those data points are just as important to the patient in, in the clinical setting as, as the primary endpoints are for a sponsor yes. that needs to get a regulatory approval. That might be all well and good, but as a patient, I'm much less concerned with what the points you, you may need as a sponsor to get approval. I wanna know what's gonna really affect me and what's gonna be my preference, what my family That's wants. Right. It might not be a, a longer survival. It might be a better quality of life. It might be a, a better segment of time when you're talking late stage oncology that I can live for a few years to see things that are important to me. And those conversations I think very rarely happen when you look and say, well, you have a 7% more chance of, of, a, of, of living five years if you take medication A versus B. And that might not be a, a patient's end goal. I think it, you know, all the comments really underscore the importance I think healthcare providers, oncologists, surgeons, have always had to be very good communicators. And I think the challenges have become as our treatments have become more complicated, as the trials have become more complicated, and as the time that we have with patients has become more compressed, it really puts a lot of pressure on how in the short amount of time you have with your patients do you communicate. You have to understand the level of medical sophistication and medical literacy that your patient has and convey an incredible lot of information. And what's also what I worry about is increasingly physicians themselves are less comfortable with the material, right? The best way to communicate clearly is you have a mastery of the information, but you know, how many physicians really understand what the charges their patients are going to face uh, because they don't know which coverage they have and they so and especially as we talk about, you know, my field of genomics, like many oncologists, surgeons are just not comfortable with the information that they have to convey. So it gets very technical, gets very kind of uh, the communication starts to break down. But that's where, you know, discussion aids. That's where different ways that the patient can be engaged before the, the meeting to understand what's their top priorities. 
I think one of the things that's important is how do we make sure that patients feel empowered, that it's their right to look for a study that they can get. There are increasingly now you know, tools that allow you to match to, to clinical trials, mm -hmm. breastcancertrials.org, metastatic trial talk. There's the Biden uh, initiative today at OSCO was talking about this big initiative where we're trying to have a better set of trials with the same set of information that everyone can have access to so they know how these different genomic tools work or the different trials work. But how does, how do we get that information to patients to make sure they understand they're empowered and they should ask and know to get access to that? I think that's another issue. I think okay. TJ brought up a, a great uh, yeah. point that supports that as well. It's, it's not only just the patients, but it's also the, the clinicians which sit in these community hospitals. Because I think, I think that's, it, it's really interesting to see these, these uh, clinical trials that don't have enough patients to fill them. And you look at the, the, the occurrence, you know, the, the rate uh, for these, these given types of cancer, and, and the math doesn't you know, work out where you should have enough um, patients to fill those trials. Right. But it's because they're not reaching into all of those um, you know, hundreds and thousands of, of, of points of care throughout the world uh, that, that are seeing these patients. And I think, I think it's, it's both engaging with the patients and also the clinicians. But I think it's another dimension as far as while we're talking about clinical trials. It's the idea of, am I actually making the right decision because, you know, it's not quite like this, you know, what if I'm on the placebo or, or whatever it is? So people don't grasp it's the standard of care plus X. That, that's one of the things that puts off a lot of people from clinical trials. It's the, it's the lack of understanding that you will be getting the standard of care plus something else in there, depending on how, how far down the treatment path you've gone. Or maybe we should do a better job of designing trials that everyone wants to be on. So I find in my practice that adding that clinical trial information to the reports and discussions with the primary care physician really allows for mm -hmm. better understanding and better comprehension of this, once the patient leaves your office, you've got somebody else who is an advocate, both for the patient, but also for their disease process and to help the patient in the shared decision-making. Edith, you said something about an advocate. And I think one thing that we always miss is that technology can be an advocate both for the patient and for the physician. There's no way that a practicing oncologist can screen or, or the staff screen every patient every night for every trial. So I, I'm a huge proponent of right, making right. technology an advocate. Use it where you will and, and let each person benefit from it. Um, one of the things that we do and we do really well is we as we screen every patient every night for every trial, we can find those patients that are not a good fit. So the 10% of the patients that are a good fit are the ones that are being worked on by the clinical staff. That's when you get a higher hit rate and you walk down the hall and have a consenting discussion to your point about this could be a good treatment option for you. And then you together with the patient make a decision to put them on a trial. I, I don't think that there's enough um, technology use where it would benefit the most. Mm -hmm. Well, the dimension I just wanted to uh, um, mention in closing is um, I grew up in a system in Britain uh, with the National Health Service. And the National Health Service was there to serve you, and you can go and get anything done within the um, uh, amount of budget for your particular area, if you like. Mm -hmm. So there are different areas, so if you're in a big budget area, you get a lot of things and not necessarily in other areas. But the question of clinical trials seems to rarely come up since it's a, it's a general health service system for the people, not just a specialty cancer area. And that's what we're talking about here. So for those people watching in Britain, it is a completely different paradigm here in the United States that doesn't have a national health system but it has an insurance plan system that you buy or you have to pay for having your health care 
and you pay for what you get. So what are the actual barriers to getting people onto clinical trials and how do we solve that? So I'll start. Okay. It's well recognized that few patients with cancer participate in clinical trials and there have been uh, so barriers the that, that it's have about ten percent or no five percent. No, it's 5%. more like five percent. I, I, I was purposely optimistic. <laughs> in, in, in adults, in pediatrics, sure. it's, it's more like sixty to seventy percent of it. Pediatrics, yeah. it's very different. So yeah. I think we're talking about adult medicine sure. now. So yes, there are recognized barriers. Uh, for example, older individuals do not participate in clinical trials as well as younger individuals. Um, minority populations, African-Americans, Latino and Hispanic populations participate in clinical trials at a lower level or a lower rate than the Caucasian population. Uh, also, individuals who have low incomes or low family incomes participate in clinical trials at a level lower than um, individuals with resources. Uh, and consequently, it's so important that we design clinical trials and look at those social determinants of health that allow participation. So certainly all of those are barriers. I think in addition, there's just a lack of awareness that trials even exist. And I think people are overwhelmed when they're diagnosed and they don't have the time to think or understand that there might be other options even out there. I know that a number um, of advocates where we were really wanted to try and solve this problem and we originally were trying to have a clinical trial referral service to really try and make sure that every patient knew about it, but nobody wanted to share their protocol. So a group of patients, including uh, someone who is the um, SVP of uh, uh, Shutterfly set up uh, breastcancertrials.org as a way to try and make it patient facing. So and it's something that's out there for everyone in the United States. You can just put your uh, information in and it's very patient friendly. But a lot of this is about educating people. What is a trial? It's hopefully, you know, it's about testing tomorrow's medicines today. It's giving access to things that you hope will work. But the reason you don't just use them is because you don't know if they're going to work. But I would say then, you know, besides educating people, I think another really important thing is that we need to design studies that are interesting and really meet the needs of our patients and really address the questions and concerns they have. Make sure that it's not, we're not just testing A versus B, we're trying to really focus on trying to get people to better outcomes. And how do we do that? So I think we need some innovation in design. And I think we can, in oncology, we can learn a lot from the AIDS movement. Great. I was going to say, tell us your real world experience. Uh, the awareness part uh, is, is, a, is a huge one. Uh, when I, I actually, as a recent college graduate, I was an IT project manager in the, in the pharmaceutical world. So I understood what, what clinical trials were. And my understanding of them was, <laughs> That was something that someone else did so that medicine is going to get approved. <laughs> it doesn't become reality until you realize that, yes, it can be part of, of okay. my healthcare solution, my, my journey, what I can, should consider as an option. Uh, but I don't think that the awareness, the biggest strategy in awareness, aren't going to come from educating patients directly. It's hard to understand it as a trial. It's, it's, the, it's the 1 million clinicians. It's the 2 million nurses, it's the other parts of the healthcare system that if we introduce the concept of clinical research as a care option early in the conversation, you might not have to know all the answers. I might not be able to say that I know what trial is right for you, but if I'm a primary care physician, and I, this has happened to me, mm -hmm. my primary care physician came in with a bunch of printouts right from a Google search. And I'm, I, I can do that. Like I can, <laughs> I can type something in, in, a, in a browser bar. I need your insights. I need your, your professional Judgment. understanding to guide me. Yeah. Get me to the place I need to go to to make my right decision. Yeah. And don't we also need to reduce or change the incentives to make people who maybe are in the community where trials aren't, aren't ongoing to feel good about referring people mm -hmm. on to trials? I think that's 
that's another. I think that's sure. a huge point because what what we find we work in the U.S. only with community oncology hospital systems and academic medical centers. And what we find is there's a historic problem in that the sponsors of the trials go back to the same well over and over again. For each trial, they go back to the same site. They have no idea whether or not the patients exist at that site. So what we are able to do is we see the patients, the match for inclusion exclusion criteria, we now can work directly with the pharmaceutical sponsor and say, for this trial, which is designed well, these are the sites that you should open because there are eligible patients right now. And using predictive analytics, we can see that those patients that are eligible will become available as soon as they fail the, the line of therapy that they're on right now. Mm -hmm. And to us, that's really important that you have the right trials open at the right site, and then we have to get the patients well, to the trial. Well, yeah, there are also some really cool companies that are talking about trying to figure out how to take the trials to the patients. I think that's also really cool. I mean, you were talking about barriers. If you have a busy life and you've got a child whose kids who are in school, you maybe you don't your, your resource constrained, you, you have many other issues, maybe you have some other illnesses, you, you don't have time to think about it. But if the trial came to the house and people helped you participate, and we, I think we just need to rethink how, if we want trials to really reach people, let's really think differently about how we can get, you know, get these services to people um, who need them. Oh, sure. And the other thing is, if you compare communities outside of the academic center are the major um, hospital, or major center. Uh, there are many individuals that don't trust the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. There is the history of Tuskegee right. for many African Americans and others who know about Tuskegee. So there is a lack of trust in the healthcare system. So we have to extend those kinds of uh, relationships that can improve the trust in the healthcare system. Therefore, uh, reaching physicians and other community individuals who can help with this, having uh, lay navigators in the communities who know individuals who live there, but who can bridge the gap between the community and the healthcare system. I mean, I, a lot of these comments is really changing the system so it's very patient focused, right? Understanding Absolutely. the social determinants of those of patients and ensuring that there's broad access. I mean, I've been participating in cooperative groups and we've looked at trials and sometimes you have trials that go like gangbusters and sometimes you have trials that languish and we've looked at characteristics of those and oftentimes you can't find a single characteristic about the trial or about the way of, and how the trial was set up. And I think a lot comes down to oftentimes the patient-centric approach is not, a, not, not taken and that perspective and those determinants of, of patients' willingness to participate in a trial and all the elements that we've touched upon that goes into that a physician's willingness to introduce that patient to a trial in a way that that is, you know, interesting to the patient um, really is, is critical to get broad, uh, a broad participation. Uh, I will plagiarize something that I heard today at ASCO is that that patients aren't for trials. Trials are for patients. Mm -hmm. And when you can make that mind shift, uh, take that little different step mm -hmm. uh, when companies design trials, when researchers implement those trials in their practice, and really understand what that patient journey is, I think you'll see that participation goes up, uh, adherence goes up, and trial success, from at least from a, let's finish a trial, get it enrolled, get it, That's com right. get it completed, mm -hmm. that will accelerate the pace of medicine. So many of the trials are molecularly informed. So the standard of care for a specific diagnosis may or may not include a specific <laughs> molecular diagnostic test. As rapidly as these are, these tests are coming along, how do you make a decision for a patient to, 
to test or not to test on a specific molecular mutation that may or may not be the inclusion criteria for a specific trial. I think that for us is one of the barriers in that we don't have all of the unique test results for a molecular diagnostic that could identify a patient for a trial. So I, I think it's actually important to be thoughtful about, you know, there are many mutations, there are many things that you can find, but they are not necessarily all drivers. You know, when we set up trials, we often think we know how a drug works. When we set up diagnostic tests, you might want to comment, we often think we know what these are, how these work, but just because there's a pathway and just because you can target it does not mean that that's going to work. I think it's really important that we hold ourselves accountable to saying, we think this might work, let's test it. And I think a lot of trials, we've tried to take the approach to say, let's let the data teach us. Let's make sure that we have, you know, you know, when you try and do it in practice, you also have to make sure that it's affordable for patients. And you have to, when you're doing it in a trial, you're trying to figure out, okay, I, I honestly don't know what's best. Let's learn, let's find out how the drugs work best. And then you start to evolve and learn. And you actually, you have to be careful not to be so sure of the answer and that you're not trying to prove that you're right or wrong, that you're really trying to make sure that the data teaches you. And all these things, the reason why it's not all standard yet is because it's not all true. All these mutations are not drivers. Many of them are just kind of along for the ride. Right, Phil? You know, we are moving to a point though, as the number of, targeted therapies become available as standard of care and, and testing broadens, there is movement towards more comprehensive testing so that there is opportunities if, if patients don't have a variant or a mutation that can has a drug readily available, they do have many of the genes that have been tested and could be eligible for participation for in a recent study. You know, if you look at comprehensive molecular profiling, you know, without Comprehensive molecular testing with just focused testing, only about 4% are found to have the variants for some trials where it go, can go up as high as, you know, half of patients now are eligible for trials because so many of these trials do use these molecular um, markers as ways to enter trials. And I, I think it becomes very personal, right? I, I mean, I think we have to look at, there's different ways to look about molecular profiling, but because cancer, we know each cancer is an individual disease. The constellation of specific mutations are going to be unique to that person. And there's nothing more personal than getting that profile and then figuring out what is the trial that's you know most best for that patient. And that's a very patient-centric approach. But isn't it also sure. true that we have to make sure that if we're telling someone to get a test, that we start thinking about how to run these tests in a way that they can be used that the variety, you know, that everyone doesn't have their own tests. So patients don't have to keep repeating their tests. That you have platforms that allow you to get more than one of these, uh, you know, answers about what a target is, and it's not, because it's not fair, it's too expensive, right? Right, and I think, I think you bring up a good point, and, and so does Phil, which is, um, there's an assumption that when that test is run, and the, 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 the tests that are the most pervasive in our industry you know, there's something like only 5% or 7% of those uh, markers are actionable, as you probably very well know. And, and so I think from a patient's perspective, if they see that they have a given marker or mutation or something like that, they think, oh, this is great. There's an answer. There's a path for me. And in, in reality, I think what's happening is, is there's a collection of information that's happening. And that's why those, those markers are growing on these panels and these tests, because there's a, a, only a small set of those which are actionable. Yes, and, sure, and certainly in our institution, it's almost the standard of care of everybody yes, yeah. gets, gets sequenced, whole genome right. sequencing, that's it. We're not actioning it, <laughs> but it's there to the day that we can action it. That is correct. And we also must recognize that for patients with certain tumors, while the incidence of the mutation may be low, but it might be very important for that patient who has an actionable target and there are medications that target that particular mutation. And therefore, I think we need to continue learning and there will be con um, a continuous learning process. Not only that, the number of markers changes from years to year, and therefore we may have to test patients 
more than one time, uh, more than one time in history. So I think it is uh, reactive optimism, meaning that we have to be optimistic, but we have to be realistic also that we convey the right information to the physicians who take care of the patients so that referrals can be made. And one of the things is continuous educational processes for the referring physicians, for the primary care physicians, and for the oncologists in communities so that there is a communication between the providers such that there is continuous evaluation process so that a doctor can call you to say, what can I do for this patient? Or I have this patient who has XXX and there is a good relationship that there will be uh, no gaps in the communications. And that's so important. So genomic profiling has made a big difference in oncology care. Well, I want to finish that off at this particular point and then move on to the, um, the last question. Um, but I, I wish to be provocative. Um, and you uh, made me think about um, when you mentioned age. Um, this is probably not what you were talking about, but it reminded me of how the age problem was controlled. Dr. Fauci gave, gives great lectures on this. And the whole point of the clinical trials that was going wrong with the AIDS is that none of the companies would cooperate with each other to come out with the correct <laughs> clinical trial mm -hmm. to put A and B together because it was about our drug versus your drug. That's right. and, and that was the end of the thing. They would not do it at all. So here's the, Dr. Fauci's story. Is they saw a problem and the companies would not play ball because we have this drug, we have that drug. How do we get everybody in the same tent to do a combination chemotherapy for AIDS that is going to work? So what the government did is says, we will pay for it all, including all of the drug, all of the clinical trial, everything. And it was doable. So the government paid for that to make that work, and that was successful. The problem we have today, and this is where we come on to the last question about emerging advances in cancer research, if that is one of the problems with the companies, the others is the biology and doing the right experiments, where do we go from here to be able to actually knock it on the head and knock it out? Well, I, 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 I'd like to, I'll be the first to, to step in here. I think and why not? And why not? <laughs> exactly. So I, you know, I actually, uh, I not only do I believe we need a sea change in the way we run trials, I am actually trying to do that. And, you know, in the iSpy trial, here's the here's the thought that what if you if we look at the segment of patients who are at high risk for early recurrence, and we say, look, rather than waiting for people to get metastatic disease, let's move the drugs earlier. Let's take drugs that we here, here. move them earlier <laughs> and test them and develop a surrogate endpoint. Why wait? You know, people don't well, want to. Well, look at breast cancer. I mean, right. for years, I'm banging everybody on the head. Right. Why are we doing the metastatic disease? Correct. We, we know right. it's not going to work. Right. And the thing is, the best way to treat metastatic disease is Good. to prevent it. Right. So the so and and in and I spy we've trust we've now brought eighteen drugs and combinations in, you know, across twelve different companies in the same trial. We're running the same trial, and we said, nope, we're going to get an early endpoint. And when we started, that you know, the FDA hadn't agreed to this being an early endpoint, but we have generated the data to show, wow, this is a great early endpoint. Okay, so here's the sea change, and I'm going to direct this at you. Okay. So I'm if ready. you it's know, <laughs> no, 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 here's the sea change. You know that we have demonstrated that if you get, if the tumor goes, if you change the order of therapy, you get the treatment first, the tumor, we measure whether the tumor goes away in that four to six month period of time. If the tumor goes away or nearly goes away, you have 
a great chance of survival. And the more tumor you have left, the worse it is. If you have tumor left, what are you going to want to do? I'm, I'm going to want to get the rest of it out. I no, no. So you, so you have surgery. At the mm -hmm. time you operate on it, you know you have more treatment. You're going to want more treatment because I, you know, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the way in which we can run trials is uh, now completely changed. So I say, organize a trial so you give everyone multiple shots on goal before they get to the OR. Try and figure it out because they're going to go do that and make getting every patient to complete response your endpoint. Not comparing drug A to B. If I said, wow, participate in this trial, I'm going to give you, if this doesn't work, we're going to move on to that. And that'll be the best thing for your shop type. But if it still doesn't work, we're going to give you something else. Mm -hmm. You'd want to be on that trial, right? Absolutely. Right? And so what we have to do now is we're working with the FDA. We're talking about it. And all our advocates are about this. Why not make it about curing the disease? What that means is we have to change our regulatory strategy. And this is where I come back to AIDS. When people saw that there were drugs that worked and there was an early endpoint, your CD4, CD8 count, or viral load, get people to that right outcome. And, and the advocacy community absolutely stood up and said, we're, we're not going to, we don't want to be randomized. We're not, we're not going to do it, right? Because, and they started sharing their pills. So, you know, <laughs> that they made it very clear. But so everyone, they had, you know, people getting to this right endpoint, and there are 200 retroviral drugs that are approved today. So what we're trying to do is say, let's get everyone to that PCR endpoint. Let's, what if we pushed and said we were going to get 90% of patients to PCR by subtype? That would be a great thing. You have to aspire to doing it better. And what you can show is, if in three years, 90% or 92% of people are surviving, why isn't that good enough? Why do you have to make a drug A or versus B? And why can't you say if your drug is at least this good, why not? Why shouldn't that be part of the armamentarium? I, I, I say it's time for a seat change. So I'd like to add to that, but also we've got to recognize that cancers are all different. Disease processes are different. And what happens in breast cancer doesn't happen in all breast cancers. For example, triple negative breast cancer, you can treat till you don't see anymore and still there is uh, an early recurrence. So we can't have one type of pattern or strategic plan that works for every tumor. Of course. We've got to understand each tumor and we've got to understand how to deliver it to patients. And even with AIDS. I don't think Laura was saying that this one equation. I mean, I, I think the, the using the endpoint of pathologic complete response has been really a, a game changer as far as of course. understanding who's responding, being able to adapt therapy. You know, coming up with earlier endpoints that are meaningful so that you can be more agile. One of the problems are is oftentimes oncologists and others treating are resistant to change. We, right. We're not willing to take a lower threshold of evidence to move on to the next because we're mostly trying to get the longest response possible rather than going for the cure um, in case. And a lot of that's because we haven't had therapies to get us to cure, quite frankly, right? An in advanced time. disease yes, right. with chemotherapy, if you just have chemotherapy, you are not, and you have a woman with metastatic breast cancer, you have a man with metastatic prostate cancer, lung cancer, that you're not going to get to cure. So you're trying to prolong life while minimizing side effects, give them the healthiest and longest life possible. I think we're changing, we're moving to a manifestly different time in oncology where more and more, not only are we gonna have better screening diagnostics to stage shift, so we'll see fewer patients diagnosed with later stage disease, mm -hmm. but we'll have the ability with those stage two, stage three, who likely have cells outside drive to, to drive them. to right. a cure with the combination of immune therapy, targeted therapy, cytotoxic, I think will still play a role because they have some really impactful cytotoxics. Mm -hmm. And radiation, using a whole armamentarium. I, you know, I'm a biased. I think it begins with understanding the person, understanding the person's genome, That's the right. tumor genome, and really being more agile. And I think, Laura, your comments are so, so often we, we're like, well, we really want to play this all the way out. No, be impatient. Like, you know, move more well, that quickly. Sure. <laughs> and we know that. I would just like to add that um, having a multidisciplinary team approach to taking care of patients 
is so important so that you've got everybody involved at the early stages of evaluation of the patient in terms of diagnostic plan, the treatment plan, right. and you have this involved early on rather than later so that we're getting all of the various therapies early in the patient's disease process and therefore having the best option for integrating all of these approaches to the patient's care and thereby uh, getting to a point where we can say we are uh, providing better patient outcomes. Well, that actually is an incredibly important point. And that's what you were talking about, Phil, is change. What the, you know, that whole multidisciplinary care. I'm a surgeon. When someone comes in with a big cancer that's threatening their life, I know 100% that my surgery is not going to save that person's life. And what I use my craft wisely to say, you know what, the best thing for us to do is change the order of therapy. And the, so the surgeons need to get out of the way and say, oh, let, let me start with the systemic. If, if, now, this isn't true for everyone, but for the types of cancers where the systemic therapy is going to save their lives, because people don't die because the cancer's in the breast or in the prostate. They die when it gets outside of the, of, of the organ and and, and takes over a, a mission critical organ like the lung or the liver and kills you. So what you're trying to do is start with that therapy that makes the difference in getting rid of the tumor everywhere. And that means that you sequence the surgery later. And what that gives you is an, a, a great way to assess how well it worked. So you're, and, it, and you can, it's just that paradigm of saying, you know what, I'm gonna make sure that I learn in the course of care and I learn on every single person so that I can keep changing and advocating and, and, and coming up with those combinations. So that means everyone, all of us as clinicians have to change. And maybe we're gonna use molecular tools differently or we're gonna use our, you know, the normal things we've always done and to say, wow. And, and I, the great thing is, if I make the tumor go away, the amount of surgery I do is so much less. But also the kinds of therapy they need afterwards is a lot less. Mm -hmm. These are all things for us to think about. How can we accelerate our learning? How can we take advantage of the great changes in, in molecular diagnostics and all of these new, new great drugs? That means we have to aspire to integrate them differently and say we're going to drive people to a better outcome and start doing that now. That's a different way than we've practiced medicine, and we have to do it all together, but Absolutely. do it now. Laura, the, the thing that I'm um, wrestling with a little bit is, is I understand how that can be done you know, if you have A, B, C kind of therapy options and you want to maybe change the order. Um, the thing that I'm, I'm wrestling with a little bit is, is you know, we have a small number like in, in IO therapies. Let's say there's a small number of therapies that are on the market now. I think in 2016, there were 600 of them in clinical trials, both uh, individual and, and combinations. Um, I looked last week and it looks like there's more than 2,400 now in individual and, and combinations. And so how does that happen, you know, when this sea of, of uh, options come, you know, and, and are presented to a physician like yourself and many of those that are, that are on our panel? Well, I think we've also tried to think about running the trials differently and, um, you, know, uh, you know, really trying to have, you know, we have um, a, a group of 22 sites around the country and we all work on trying to say we're going to all, you know, we're not running a trial for every I think this is also another important innovation. Instead of running a trial for every drug, that would take you forever. We have one trial, and the trial never changes. Mm -hmm. And what we are doing is we're looking for different combinations, and we're building on the last one. And, you know, it, you know, we're constantly putting new things in and changing it so that you can, uh, so that you can learn in a more timely mm -hmm. fashion. I think we have to think about more platform trials. You see the FDA really pushing this idea. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important. We've traditionally, if a company wants to test their drug, they're going to control it and have their trial. If they, uh, if if it's their diagnostic or their their drug. But in fact, if your goal is to get a patient to the best outcome, you may want to mix and match. And we used to get credit for writing trials, and that's how we got promoted. We have to put all that well, we, aside. We are seeing that. I mean, I think you led the charge with Ice by One. We see Osco's taper trial. We right. see And match. tomorrow during plenary, where he'll the pediatric match trial. Which is great. Where 
you know, drug companies are saying, okay, we'll participate as one of many drug companies. And if a patient has a variant that is a, a, appropriate for our drug, we'll participate in that way. And it, it avoids that kind of one drug, one, one at a time. Yeah. The and, and, there, and drugs by class are also important, right? Yeah. So you have to say, it is true, every PD-1 drug may not be the same. But in fact, they're not going to be that different. It's just like all the Good. aromatase inhibitors, right? Are they this. all different? Yeah. Well, they didn't turn out to be they any different. They didn't turn out to be any different. And so, so you can That can't, cost billions. Right, yeah, we can be algebraic. Out. We can be algebraic about it and say, well, if this doesn't work in this combination, so I, and, the, and, and if someone says, well, I don't want to study that, you can turn to someone else and say, wow, we think this is a good idea. But if, if we were in this mode and everyone was able to participate and we collected that data in a way that we were all learning, wouldn't that be extraordinary and how much faster it would go? Sure, right? but that's so, a part of what is ongoing now with the um, Cancer Moonshot data collection and sharing is a part of that. That is ongoing. Uh, you mentioned pediatric match, mm -hmm. but adult match, mm -hmm. we have one protocol. Mm -hmm. Right now, we have 39 different yeah. drugs based on various targets. Perfect. And it's all working together. It is a National Cancer Institute sponsored trial. Uh, ECOG Akron Cancer Research Group is the manager. Uh, and all of the companies have provided those 39 drugs That's and we're say. evaluating them. Not only do we understand that um, there are certain drugs for various cancers, but the toxicities and the side effects of therapy based on patient differences. What drugs that the matters. patients mm -hmm. might be on, where a drug might give poor interactions or undesired effects. And looking at all of that, I happen to be the PI for toxicity on the match trial. Which is and I tell you, there have been over 6,800 patients accrued. I have looked at the toxicities on all 6,800. And therefore, putting these things together where we can understand with the NCI, with the cooperative uh, former cooperative groups, and the cancer institutes, all working together with patient advocates. We've got patient advocates on every one. We're learning so much and making it available for more patients. And consequently, with the pharmaceutical companies, the NCI, ECOG Akron and all of the other um, NCTN groups, we're all working together on that. But that's And that's been a big sea change. And I think one other thing that is happening that's going to change some of this is it's often very hard for patients to get their own data. Right? It's Did you like, struggle with that? I still do. Okay, exactly. So the Office of the National Coordinator has actually just issued a set of rules that are based on the 21st Century Cures Act, actually public comment, open till July to June 3rd. Everyone should put in comments. And this says that you cannot block, you know, uh, people from getting information they want. So if you want to pull information, you should be able to get it. And why this is so important is it opens the door to third-party applications being able to pull things in. So like in the electronic records, we're stuck with whatever we have and we can't use all this fantastic technology that's out there. But these rules say that, you know, people writing applications to help pull data and make things available or to electronically send data if you want to do trial matching, if you want a patient wants to have it. I, I had a patient the other day said, they want me to fax a request to get my, my, my tumor block, my tissue block, I don't have a fax machine. What's a fax machine? <laughs> <laughs> She's 35. I said, well, send it to us. We'll request it to you. That's right. Go to Zen Rock's fax. What's his what's, what's what's Zen Zen <laughs> Exactly. But, but a lot of this, but this is, we, we've allowed ourselves to, to do things in old ways. And, and, and our systems, because we're afraid of, of sometimes change, but also it's actually a lot of work. But we haven't really allowed that kind mm -hmm. of change. So I, I think these rules are great but I think we should go even farther. I think all of us on this panel would say, wouldn't it be amazing if we had 
standardized checklists of mission critical data that everyone collected the same. And instead of, you know, you know, paying for a 12 point review of systems, we actually paid for this mission critical data set. We did this instead of having scribes for the physicians, we had scribes for the patients. And everyone had that ability to get that data. We could well, exchange it. It kind of mm -hmm. underscores where you, you know, you mentioned this, but a lot of what we think about is how do you, you know, obviously having better trials that bring together multiple options for patients are much more attractive. But I, I think that there's still, because of some of the dynamics we mentioned at the beginning of the discussion, fewer patients will go on those trials than will receive care. And how do you create those learning loops from right. the patients undergoing standard of care where every patient's path with cancer, every patient's cancer journey contributes and improves the next patient's cancer journey. And how do you do that? By integrating the systems of care and research, right? So what are we practicing for? We should be practicing to improve, not just practicing. Yeah. So that means we should know what we are doing, you know, what our complications are and what our outcomes are. And so if that system of care looked like that way, that's the data we need for trials. It would be so much. And if that's one source of data, we're working on some of these with the FDA. There's a whole group of people around the country mm -hmm. trying to work on that. The moonshot, the Biden mm -hmm. moonshot has been trying to talk about that. But if we actually stop thinking, oh, here's the, here's the research side and the trial side, and here's the care side, imagine you can't fix the trial, the efficiency of the trial system by fixing the trial system. You have to fix the clinical care side. So to your but point, think, uh, the, the challenge, I think, for those patients who are not going to go on a clinical trial, or to your point, I hear you saying you want to introduce the art of medicine back into the daily practice. And unfortunately, our, we have physicians who are worried about the business of oncology. They have to see X number of patients per day to be able to you know, keep the doors open in community oncology practices. There are so many barriers between patient getting the coverage that they need and the physicians, there are entities that stand between the art that you would like to do and the coverage that they are willing to approve for the patients. And having been through that recently, I should not have to call and have an attorney on a call with me to talk to my payer to get a test approved. And I don't know if you experienced the same sort of thing, but if someone is approaching it artfully, I shouldn't have to fight with the payer to get a test covered. Well, I think a little well, bit more of coverage with evidence right. development. If we're doing coverage with evidence development and inviting the payers in, it should be also their responsibility to help generate the evidence. Agreed. And everyone sitting at the table, and we're trying to do that in the trial and the wisdom study to, you know, so that the payers are there and everyone can look at the data, but they have to pay because you can come up, Every all of us are, should be trying to think about building a better mousetrack. How do I make something that's more effective and less expensive and less toxic for patients? And if we can show that, then everyone should be contributing while we're generating the evidence, get the payers involved, so then we don't have to go beg and spend another 10 years. So you come up with a great test, now I have to spend 10 years trying to get the insurance companies to pay for it. So let's also change the way in which we get people together just to really and design these that's trials. what I mean by the multidisciplinary team approach in that for any healthcare system, you will know where the majority of your payers lie and what their names are. So bringing them in early to have them a part of the process is also important. But one area that we need to think more about is not just treatment, but prevention. And prevention of the disease is the best way to cure it. Therefore, um, working with programs uh, I don't know if you are aware of the All of Us program from NIH. Mm -hmm. uh, it is planned for uh, over a million participants, and we don't call them patients. We call them participants. The individual participants will have access to their data and therefore able to use that. So for example, through the specimen collections, if there is uh, a mutation or a risk for a mutation found, that individual will have that information much earlier in their process. And for example, in breast cancer, 
you don't have to wait for another family member to uh, present with a BRCA-related tumor. You may have that individual information first. You know, I'm working with a family where a young individual in her 20s developed breast cancer and it is BRCA positive. There is no family member that has ever had a cancer related. So her mother gets tested and is BRCA positive, uh, but had never had cancer. So finding that information early so that disease processes can be prevented is, uh, I think, should also be a part of our research. And I encourage other programs um, like all of us, but participation in all of us. So with over a million participants, our computational scientists can help us put all of that data together on over a million individuals so that we've got additional uh, information. So it's bringing everybody that's a part of the team that has a stake in the ultimate outcome, bringing us all together, the payers, Medicare, Medicaid, um, patient advocates, the computational um, scientists, and bringing all of us together with the clinicians so that we can understand our data that we've collected and we can find better ways of collecting the data so that we as clinicians have a better opportunity to uh, assess our yeah. outcomes. Finally, what I would like to do is ask the panel individually, what is the new area that you think is the most exciting in a minute or two of just focusing on that area as we go around the room? Well, uh, again, uh, I'm biased and I'm at Illumina, but the reason I'm at Illumina is because I believe that our understanding of individual genomes and our earlier recognition using genomic insight of diseases will result in many patients with cancer either undergoing more targeted screening so they get diagnosed or undergo preventative measures because they're at higher risk or those that have spontaneous cancer can be diagnosed earlier so that we can really go for the cure in many more patients. And so you could say I'm biased because I'm at Illumina, but the reason I'm at Illumina is because I have had that bias for my whole career. Thank you very much. So at IntelliQuit, um, the thing that I'm most excited about is that we're breaking down the barriers, uh, the silos. The data lives still in silos across academic um, medical centers, ac across hospitals we are able to bring in all of that data from the electronic medical record, the lab information system, the molecular diagnostic, look at it across disease types, and then make some decisions about it. Our goal is using that data for all healthcare stakeholders as one source of truth. So the patient can look in, the pharmaceutical company can look in, the, the payer, uh, the clinical trial, the CROs, everyone can look into this one source of truth that is spin free, look in, take what data you will, and go make a personal choice for yourself. And so that's what we're currently working on. Thank you. I'm going to build on top of that and something you mentioned earlier, uh, the right treatment for the right person at the right time. There's a, there's a huge element of what we call big data behind that. And it's not just insights into what mutation will be treated by what drug or what sequence we should put the drugs in, but really the entire part of the cancer journey. When someone is diagnosed, most likely they don't know very much about what their treatment options are. So I will need the right data at the right time, not just the insights of, of a molecular level, but what do I need to know about my data? What is it about the treatment options that I have that's going to affect my health my family, my finances, the people around me, all the things that are gonna build my life. Uh, that's the information we know. How do I find someone that's a peer? Mm -hmm. Who can I connect to that might have my same disease or my same mutation? Mm -hmm. And how do I learn from all of them? How do I get all of that data to a patient 
at the right time when they need it most. We'll build it for you. I, all right, I can't wait to help. <laughs> okay, I will speak last, Laura. Um, I'm actually really excited about, you know, the changes that the, the changes in science that are allowing us to understand what our, you know, a, a better understand what the risk factors are and really who's really at the most risk for progressing and our ability to adjust and test treatment types based on that and whether it's imaging as a marker or the emergence of circulating DNA to be able to tell whether someone is still at risk even if the tumor goes away. And that in fact may be the biggest game changer for women or when we give treatments for long periods of time that maybe we finally will have a marker that says, wow, the hundreds of thousands of women can stop taking medicines that are causing them side effects every day. And we can know when to start and when to stop, kind of like what you guys do with PSA, you know? So I think that the science is changing, that there are, there's a change in the mindset and the skill sets and the tool sets for us to really take what we have now and build better trials, more collaboration, and a platform for learning faster and getting people uh, to a place where their lives are no longer at risk and to even take that back to the prevention setting and trying to make adjustments early enough so they never get in the first place. Thank you. I think I'm going to pick up on two things that TJ said that I, that I think a lot about. One is a lot of industries go through this area of kind of big data and there's collection and generation of all of this. And we, we hear about big data in, in, in our industry quite a bit, too, too much, uh, many would argue. And I think there's this, this need to go from, from all of this data to insights and then insights to tools and pragmatic tools that we can actually put to use. And I think that's one of the things that I'm most excited about in our industry is, is making that move. And I think we're probably just on the front end of that, of moving from all of that data and how to, to bring it in uh, to, to make, you know, put it into a pragmatic tool for making decisions in the clinic. Uh, that's what I'm very excited about. I think the second thing I'll pick up on what TJ said, which is, I think in order to do that, you need context. You need to take a person's own individual data and be able to put that in the context of all of the other data that's out there. And I think we're still, unfortunately, a long way from doing that. I think it's it's a, a worthwhile um, thing for us to pursue. And, and there's, as we've talked about today, many things that are put in place that have been put in place for decades that are in our way of doing that. Um, but I'm actually optimistic with a lot of companies that I see being built today that are um, you know, a new generation of people, they don't understand why things are that way and almost naively going after those problems because they don't know any better, so to say. Um, so I'm really excited about those two things, which is moving away from this, this realm of big data into actual useful tools. And number two is being able to take any patient's um, individual data and put it in the context of hundreds of thousands of other data sets. Thank you. Um, so... I'm excited about two areas of care. It's well recognized that we've got more tools now, more targets, we understand them better, and the number of these targets increasing asymptotically so that we've got better uh, tools to work with in caring for our patients. However, I'm concerned about making sure that all patients have access to uh, these new technologies so that every patient can get the best therapy at the right time for that patient. But also, I wrote my first paper on toxicities of chemotherapy when I was a fellow. And as we put all of these modalities together, I am concerned about the long-term effects of cancer treatment on patients and how with surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, immunotherapy, and other modalities, the effects on the patient. What are the long-term effects? And how can we try to ameliorate or prevent some of these long-term toxicities? Because each modality has its own individual um, limitations or toxicities experienced by patients, and when we put them all together, how can we predict, or how can we best predict, how to manage that patient receiving all of those different therapies? So I'm really concerned about the data, 
and how we can collect that data and utilize it to the best benefit of the patient, trying to protect the patient from long-term effects of all of these therapeutic modalities. Thank you. You used one word, predict. Last year in JAMA Oncology, there was a, um, an expose, if you like, of looking at all of the clinical trials that they are moving forward on putting drugs on the market with a second and C sort of attitude. So they will get responses, and if the responses are uh, balanced out with uh, side effects, um, then that drug can go on the market. We have no predictive tests that are effective, that I really know, for immunotherapy, for targeted therapies. It's a suck it and see attitude. We need money to be invested, and for Jammer Oncology, my fellow uh, Dr. Abdurrahman and I wrote a letter saying that money should be dedicated from the NIH. Grants specifically looking at predictive tests for all of the new therapies that are coming out so that people have a chance of knowing this drug is going to work in them. Very, very important. And it's best to have it done because people in pharmaceutical industries do not like predictive tests. They want everybody to get that drug. Tamoxifen is the perfect example. In the United Kingdom, the estrogen receptor was shown in clinical trials not to work. Therefore, the company was ecstatic that every single person in the health service with breast cancer got tamoxifen. May have been a good thing in point of fact, because the tissues weren't being collected properly. That was the problem. The ER assays in the clinical trials were rubbish. So we need predictive tests to stop everybody getting drugs that they can't actually use to cure their cancer or treat their cancer. So that is my final thought. Thank you very much to the panel. Go out and find productive tests. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you.